welcome to Two Boomer Women. I'm your host, Agnes Knowles. I've been talking with Boomer Women for almost a decade now. (laughs) Well, I guess I've been talking to Boomer Women all my adult life. Uh, Reinventing myself several times along the way, though, but always focused on us, Boomer Women. With this incarnation of Two Boomer Women, I'll be interviewing other women who have a message of interest for our demographic. If you want to hear about or learn about something specific, let me know and I'll find someone who understands us to talk about it. There's a contact page at twoboomerwomen.com. If you want to be a guest on Two Boomer Women, bring it on. There's an application form at the website, too. Finally, this show is all about conversation. We women know its value. We know how to do it, and we must perpetuate the art form. So let's get started with today's show. Good morning and welcome to the Two Boomer Women podcast. I'm your host, Agnes Knowles. I've been trying to coordinate this episode and today's guest for some time. As well as being a dear friend, she is the most well-spoken person on the subject I've heard to date. In recent months, there's been increasing public awareness of young people, children, self-identifying as gay, lesbian, non-binary, two-spirit, transgendered, whether it's the recent ruling in Arkansas, with other states possibly pending, banning medical treatments for transgender youth, or Yukon Territory expanding gender-affirming health care coverage to its residents, there's certainly no consistency to any of the policymaking around this subject. I want to talk about the subject of trans children because, as grandparents, it's a conversation that may be placed in our laps at some point, and we need to be calm and say the right things. It could, literally, and I get goosebumps as I say this, um, be a matter of life and death. Why would our grandchildren come to us to talk about their gender identification? Well, admit it. We love our grandchildren completely, and we roll with the stages far better than we did as parents. Maybe they need to practice what they're going to say to their parents. Maybe they're afraid of their parents' reaction and need to know that grandma, grandpa is in their corner has their back. My amazing friend Michelle has been, and is, the rock, the support, the vanguard, shall we say, for her daughter's journey along the transitioning path for a couple of years now. Michelle, welcome, and thank you so much for having this conversation with me and for our listeners. Of course, I'm happy to be here. Now, you know I don't always use the right words um, around this subject, so as always, you know you're welcome to correct me. (laughs) Let's go back to the very beginning, before your daughter had her first gender identity talk with you. How old was she, Mm -hmm. and were there any clues, shall we say? Oh, goodness. Um, Let's see. Um, When we first talked about it, I think she was nine or ten. Yeah, I'm just trying to think how many years has it been now? (laughs) She's probably nine or ten. And at the time, it we weren't necessarily like, oh, this makes perfect sense. We've seen this coming for years. But then in looking back at things, we're like, oh, (laughs) there were some things that perhaps maybe if we had been more aware, that sort of thing, we might have realized it sooner. I think one of the biggest things is that when she was probably four or five years old, she said to me that she feels like a girl. And I thought it was about, you know, wanting to play with stereotypical girls' toys or wanting particular clothes or that sort of thing. So I was like, Oh no, honey, you know, you can, you can be a boy and still like, you know, to play with dolls or all those kinds of things. And, and thinking I'm here, I'm being this, yay, I'm forward thinking. And, you know, you, you know, your, your gender, your sex doesn't change what toys you can play with. And, you know, the toys aren't operated by any part that's different from any other kid. So you don't need to, you know, I thought that that's, what that was about and what she was really trying to articulate to me is that um, she's trans and just didn't have the words at that younger age to really articulate what she was feeling really on the inside. 
And once we started talking about it again, when she was a little bit older, nine or 10, um, when we started talking about it, then she had more of a vocabulary to be able to explain. No, it's, it's like, I'm a girl, <laughs> not I girls things. It's I am a girl. And, and this is who I am inside. And this is, I feel that, you know, they make us line up boys on this side and girls on this side. And, and I'm supposed to be in that other line. I'm not supposed to be in the boy line. I'm supposed to be in the girl line, you know, and things like that. And then I think in those moments where she was forced to really be in situations that were extremely divided along gender lines, that then that really helped her find her voice and be able to talk to me and articulate what she was, what was going on. Now, many adults, Mm -hmm. most adults probably would assume that this is a passing thing. And it's times like this when I wish we had video because I use the air quotes. Right. (laughs) (laughs) And that, you know, the child's just going to grow out of it. Mm Can you explain why that reaction is wrong and what responses are more appropriate? Mm -hmm. I think you've voiced some of that already, but if you could be really specific there. Of course, of course. Yeah, it's it's not a phase. (laughs) Just straight up, it's not a phase. No, I mean, there, there are some kids that I think are really looking for their words. And that might be a lot of what adults think of, oh, they're just exploring or they're just, you know, they they think they like this now, but, you know, a month from now, it'll be something else or that kind of a thing. I think that that is a, a reaction that makes us as adults comfortable. We want it to, you know, we're, we're like, oh, well, things will go back to the way they were. And that's where we're comfortable. Um, so I think that is a lot of people's first reaction is, oh, this is just a phase and it's no big deal. And, you know, they're just acting out because they want attention or some full thing like that. And that's, that's not what it is with trans kids. It, you will see that there is a consistent identification, that they are consistent, they're I am a girl, um, that they are persistent, that will continue over a length of time, you know, and that they are insistent about it. Like, no, this is who I am. So the kinds of things that we usually talk about or look for are consistent, persistent, insistent, right? Those three things are kind of sort of the hallmarks. So um, some more appropriate responses rather than if if a child comes to you and says, I'm trans, rather than saying, oh, that's just a phase or you don't know or, you know, you're young, it'll change, that sort of thing. Really just being open and listening because clearly this is a child. If a child comes to you and starts talking or a teenager, young adult, youth <laughs> – If someone in your life, a young person in your life comes to you and starts talking about something like this, clearly you are a person that they trust. So the best thing that you can do to maintain that trust is be open to the conversation. Allow them to tell you how they're feeling and what they're thinking and not having it be an inquisition. Okay. That's a big piece of this because I do recommend coming from a place of curiosity. So rather than jumping to conclusions, just saying, Oh, okay. And you know, so can you tell me more about that? Or, you know, what else are you feeling about that? Or what were you thinking about that? Or, you know, those types of things to, really open-ended questions to further the dialogue um, so that you get a sense of really what it is that they're thinking and feeling and their unique experience. Because also that's, that's the other thing is like not every kid's experience is going to be the same, right? We've, we've all got 
different family constellations and different levels of support at school or at home, all those kinds of things. So every kid is going to be different and every relationship is going to be different. Um, so really just coming from a place of gentle curiosity of that love that you feel for them to begin with and really just holding that in the forefront of the conversation that this child is the same child that they were yesterday and that your love is is important to them, obviously, if they've come to you as a trusted adult. I think that's one of the reasons that I really wanted to have this conversation with you today because, you know, so many of us, this isn't a cop-out, but once we're in our 60s, 70s, whatever, it's it's just not part of our reality. So it's like, uh, even if we did nothing but freeze, it's still not a helpful response. Right. Um, so just to be aware that, you know, who knows what situation you may be in in the future. And you can go like, ah, <laughs> I heard Michelle <laughs> interviewed. I heard what Michelle <laughs> said. So let me take a breath here and, you know, just proceed. Yeah. 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 Take a breath and come from a place of love. And that's easy for us grandmas and grandpas. <laughs> yeah. um, social media responses I noticed a couple of years ago were all agitated over a child and their family jumping into the medical process and the problems if the child did, and again, air quotes, grow out of their decision. Tell us what your daughter went through in terms of counseling and other things before any medical procedures were considered. Oh, Absolutely. Yes. Um, the, what you hear about uh, on social media and that, oh, they're suddenly, you know, they, they say, oh, I think I'm a girl or I think I'm a boy. And then the next day they're getting the surgeries done or something, according to social media. That is not in any way, shape or form how any of this happens. So when our daughter first came to us, we went to our pediatrician and got referrals to both a uh, gender clinic and also to um, therapists that work with kids because the, our intention was to, you know, wherever she's at on her journey, give her absolutely the best support we possibly could and the everything that we could do to help her navigate her life in any way in any realm, <laughs> you know, um, but particularly in this realm, you know, um, because we knew that there is um, a lot of confusion and lack of awareness and outright hostility towards transgender people. And so we we're like, okay, we need a support team, right? right. <laughs> let's, let's find that support team. So she started into therapy. She had been in therapy for at least a year um, before we ever did anything even remotely considering anything remotely medical. She had been um, in that counseling. She had to be seen by an endocrinologist so that we could get a sense of where she was at in her puberty. Um, because of course she was, you know, 10, 11 at that time. Um, so just on the cusp of puberty. So getting a sense of, of where she was at with that. What else did we do? So there were, there was the therapist, there was, um, the endocrinologist. There was also a psychiatrist that had to do a assessment again to make sure that everything was all the the T's are crossed and all the I's are dotted and, you know, all those other kinds of things. So we have a whole team of medical professionals, including her pediatrician, including the therapist, including the psychiatrist, including an endocrinologist, all of these people that we are coming together and making decisions based on best practices as well as what's best for her. You know, so this is by no means an overnight, all of a sudden, you know, some kid decides that they're trans and then, 
you know, within two weeks there, you know, somebody's pushing hormones and somebody's pushing surgery and all this other kind of stuff. That does not happen. <laughs> that is not at all what's happening. Before we were ever even, you know, before puberty blockers or um, hormones are even considered, kids go through all of these steps. It's it's not a it's not an overnight thing. There are not doctors out there that are prescribing things willy nilly. It's not in their best interest to do so. There is an established standard of care for trans people and trans kids um, that outlines lengths of time and what types of, of services and things like that the person should receive before doing anything that modifies their natal body in any way, shape or form. There's a lot of confusion around um, puberty blockers. And that's one thing that, that I feel like for trans kids is huge. It's hugely can be literally life-saving. So basically what puberty blockers do is they suppress the natal puberty, the, the, what they would have at their sex assigned at birth. It suppresses that puberty. It basically puts it on hold. It's like a pause button. So all it does is freeze them at that stage that they're at right then and there. And that gives them the time and the spaciousness to be able to explore this journey and figure out what they want for the long term without you know, developing facial hair without developing breasts, without, you know, their voice changing or an Adam's apple, you know, getting larger or things like that, that, you know, or without starting menstruation, you know, all of those things are very real and not reversible changes, right? So what puberty blockers do is just basically pause and allow that family and that decision-making group with the medical professionals, give them some time to figure out what's in the best interests of the child or young adult um, at that point, if they're considering puberty blockers. And this is not something new. Puberty blockers have been in place for years and years and years um, they've been used primarily, the, a lot of the studies have been done on kids with cancer and cancers that are hormone um, influenced. And so there's lots and lots and lots of, you know, medical documentation and data as to how it affects kids' bodies and things like that. There are not long lasting effects. Once a child stops the puberty blocker, they will pick up their natal puberty exactly as if it had never been paused. So if for some reason they do decide to proceed with their natal puberty, then that will happen just simply slightly delayed, you know? So that's a, that's something that there's a lot of confusion about. And I wanted to make sure we talked, to, we touched on that. Because a lot of people kind of freak out about, ah, what's this, you know, and all it does is put a pause. It just gives you time. It just gives you time because a lot of these really big changes in a, in a kid's body, in a trans kid's body, and their body almost feels like it's betraying them. And so if you can put a pause on that, and allow them to get to a place where they are emotionally stable around those concepts, around how their body is changing, how their body's going to change. If something isn't done differently, you know, that just that step alone, giving them that ability to have a fighting chance, you know, because so much of the stress for a trans kid comes because their body is doing things that they can't control, <laughs> you know? 
So. Either I've got really good notes or you're psychic. I mean, I've got to scroll <laughs> down now because you, <laughs> you've covered off like about six points here. Oh. Um, but w- while we're talking about this, um, I did want to ask, so I'm just going to flip around my own notes here a little bit. Um, you know, going back to the fact that, you know, 16 U.S. states are considering banning all medical treatments <laughs> for transgendered minors. Mm-hmm. What are the medical repercussions for a child who's already started a puberty blocker or a hormone therapy? And if they're stopped, will they be stopped cold turkey? Mm-hmm. If if the child is in one of those states and it is deemed illegal to provide them with medical care around their transition, then, and, and that family has no other resources, like being able to leave that state, (laughs) you know, because let's face it, it's a, it's a huge privilege to be able to choose where we live. Right. That, you know, well, if my state, you know, uh, banned taking care of, of kids, then I could move somewhere else or something like that. That's a huge privilege. There are a lot of trans kids that don't have that kind of support, that either don't have supportive families or or financially, they can't just pick up and move, you know, that type of thing. So those kids absolutely would be hugely affected in a in a detrimental way where potentially their care would be just completely cut off and then they would revert to their natal puberty are there any like just physical uh, uh, the, obviously the the whole mental psychological thing is mm-hmm. a, a massive great thing mm-hmm. but are there any physical issues with that immediate cutoff mm-hmm well, I'm not a doctor, so I can't say. Yeah, no, no. But yeah. <laughs> as far as I guess that's what scares me is like, you know, you know but well, and yeah. that's that's the big thing is that the people that are making these decisions are not doctors. You know, they're not endocrinologists, they're politicians. And it's just it's scary that we have uh politicians that are not educated in these areas making policy decisions with incorrect information and inserting themselves into a relationship between a doctor and a patient. And that's never appropriate. Um, I'm trying to decide where to go on my notes now. Um, Okay. I'm I'm just going to stop and just discuss the practical school, gym class, washrooms, Mm -hmm. What did you, the parent, and the school do about handling those issues? And it, like, do do you have to find a school that's <laughs> going to to deal with those issues? Right. Well, again, we are in a place of privilege, and that we were able to see. Okay, well, if this school doesn't work for us, we'll figure out something else. Right. There are a lot of folks. That's the school you're in, and that's just what you're going to get. There is an organization here in the States called Gender Spectrum. Um, it's genderspectrum.org. Um, they are based here in California. And they have a, a, a template that you can work with of all the things that you need to talk to a school about, either before your child comes out as transgender or after they've come out and you need to figure out how to deal with the logistics <laughs> and that sort of thing. So their website has those documents. I highly recommend them. That's exactly what we did. So we had this document that like, you know, it's not inventing the wheel, right? Other parents have gone through this. Other families have gone through this. There are organizations where you can get support. And, you know, sometimes early on in the process, it's like you don't even know what to ask or what to think about or all the different ways in which this touches systems that are in place at an outside organization, right? So for instance, you know, we'll we'll get to the bathrooms and the gym conversation in just a second because I know that's another hot button. But just the basics of like the attendance system, might only have room for one name and not have a space for a preferred name 
or a nickname or something like that. So then when the teacher gets the attendance role, you know, and they have to call attendance, they're basing it off of whatever's on that paper. Now, that might be all fine and good. You've had a conversation with their classroom teacher and the classroom teacher knows, okay, this is the name that I call out. Or you might get a sub that day and they don't know, right? Or let's see what else. There's There were just so many different ways in which it, you know, or the cafeteria lunch number or the cafeteria card, because that's a whole different system from the attendance system. And, you know, it's like all these different places where names and identifying information is used that if your child has not had an, a legal name change, that could be problematic, right? Where their birth name is being used and it's an obviously gendered name or something along those lines um, where you could bump into, into a lot of really challenging situations for the child to navigate. And then there's like, again, the hot button issue with the bathrooms and the gym locker rooms and that sort of thing. <laughs> there are a lot of schools that are amazing at handling kids that are outside of their normal experience, right? Their expected experience. Because our kids aren't abnormal. <laughs> it's just, they're just different from what people expect, right? There are a lot of schools that are amazing. And there are a lot of schools that have absolutely no idea what they're doing or they haven't had to do it. <laughs> they haven't had to think about it. And so they haven't thought about it. So I, I again, recommend getting those templates from genderspectrum.org. And they really give you an idea of the kinds of conversations to have. Again, I'm in California. So we have all kinds of protections at a state level that at other states won't have or that potentially provinces won't have. So really, when we first had these conversations with her school, we were focused on her experience. What are the ways and, you know, how can we put a cushion <laughs> around her to make sure that her experience on a day-to-day -day basis did not cause trauma. And so we looked at those things. Some schools will say you go to the bathroom of the gender that you identify as, period, end of story. You know, some schools will say, well, the only bathroom that we have that is mixed gender would be the one in the nurse's office. Well, <laughs> depends on how far away that nurse's office is and how easy it is for that child to get there on a break or, you know, whatever time they have to do that. It also singles that child out. And it's obvious that they're going to do something somewhere different than the other kids, right? And that's a that becomes a source of well, why do you go there? You know, little things that kids pick up on, right? And then there are some schools that like you have to go to the bathroom that you were assigned at birth, which basically means for trans kids that they're not using the bathroom when they're at school. And that can lead to all kinds of medical issues, right? If they don't feel safe at school, just to even go to the bathroom, <laughs> where else? I mean, what, I just, I, I, I get tongue tied around this because it's so, I, I just don't understand how folks can be so stuck on this concept. Like person just needs to use the toilet. They're not in there for any nefarious purpose. <laughs> <laughs> boys, you know, teen boys are not going to claim to be girls so that they can go into a girl's restroom and somehow 
stalk a teenage girl. Okay. That's not what's happening. That's not what trans kids are. That's a sexual predator. Yeah, that's not a trans sure. kid, you know? And so if you're worried about your daughters in a bathroom, what you're really worried about is sexual predators. You're not worried about trans people. And that's the difference. And I think my favorite washroom door sign is still the male, female, whatever. Just wash your hands. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> You know, do what like, you gotta do and wash your home, hands you know <laughs> at home i don't I, you know we don't have a separate toilet mostly i don't think most people do where the boys use that one, although my daughter <laughs> it, it could be a good idea in some cases but for cold yeah, right. reasons but <laughs> oh dear sorry we yeah, digress absolutely. um it's like that most people don't <laughs> have separate toilets and anytime you go to a bathroom in public that is a one single stall toilet you're in a mixed gender bathroom <laughs> um just last week we talked about how insidious is that i was looking up all these words because it just it's so it is so insidious um the depiction of the north american family being a beautiful probably white slender young woman falling in love with the handsome same color definitely athletic young man Having the perfect wedding and having one wonderful boy, one delightful girl who will grow up in the image of their parents. And how that still pervades our culture in such a potentially dangerous way. Um, even our language, you know, it's, it, he's a girly boy or she's a tomboy, mm -hmm. something like that. It's been around for even longer than I've been mm -hmm. around. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, there's so many ways in which Western culture is gendered <laughs> and just expectations of, you know, girls are supposed to be like this and boys are supposed to be like that. And any, any little transgression outside of that expectation is frowned upon and in some cases beaten out of you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it even comes down to the, the status quo problems that we've had for uh, generations where the girl dolls all have what would account to be, would, you know, work out to be about a 13 inch waist oh, yeah. as a woman. Yeah. You know, just so just, yes. I mean, it, it, it's, it's everywhere. Those sort of, I don't know, social mm -hmm definitions mm -hmm. i guess mm -hmm. that that we've allowed to keep going and hopefully it, it's it will start to change i mean it's generations it's a hundred years too late but you know it's better to plant the tree today i guess if you absolutely and i ago. and i think it is changing i think that the kids are the kids of this generation are doing so much better than than we ever did um, in, in understanding that you know, and, and understanding that they don't have to be limited by these expectations. I mean, I, you know, I think about it and it's like girls are supposed to, you know, sugar and spice and everything nice and boys are snails and puppy dog tails and, you know, all that sort of thing. Right. And it's like how limiting that is for both sides. And that, and that we teach our boys that they're not supposed to be emotional. Don't cry. And, you know, all this other kind of stuff. And why wouldn't we want our boys to play with dolls? Why wouldn't we? Yeah. That, do, don't we want them to be good fathers? Don't we want them to be comfortable holding their own baby? Don't we want them to know how to change a diaper? And, and the gentleness. Absolutely. Too, the Absolutely. Yeah. We, we want our boys to grow into fathers that are nurturing. But right now we cut them off from that. We cut our men off from nurturing and from being emotional. 
because it's no, you have to be strong. You have to be the provider. You have to, you know, fit this role of this manly, masculine man, you know? <laughs> and then at the same time, with our girls, it's like, no, you have to be small and quiet and effeminate. And you, if you speak too loudly, then you're aggressive or you're a bitch, <laughs> you know? Right. If you stand up for yourself or you question yeah. or, you know, you need to smile more like women are told that all the time. You need to smile more. And it's like, no, I don't owe you anything. And I'm allowed to have my whole range of emotions. And sometimes those emotions include anger and frustration. And and sometimes it's as simple as. And with all this Zoom stuff in the last year, I've heard it referred to as my resting <laughs> bitch face, which I, <laughs> I don't like because if I'm expressionless, right. why am right. I suddenly the bitch? It's just like maybe I'm listening, maybe I'm mm -hmm. thinking, maybe, you know, so, and, and that's a whole nother it subject. Is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> but you know, let's, let, let's bring it back to this though, right? With trans kids, right? Mm -hmm. Is that making sure that we're not imposing our ideas of what a man is or what a woman is onto these kids. So just because I had a child that was assigned male at birth and she's a woman, she's a young woman now, that doesn't mean that I have to expect her to be a Barbie doll. That doesn't mean that I have to expect her to be quiet or meek or mild or always smiling or the, the pacifier, the, the person that calms everybody down or any of those things. She doesn't have to fit into those gender roles. That is what I think is amazing about this generation of kids, too, is because they're starting to question those things, those things that we were spoon fed. And we started to question a little bit, right? You know, that's a whole, you know, women's movement in the 70s. And, you know, those we started to question a little bit. And then we're like, okay, there's a backlash. <laughs> and then we started to question a little bit. And that's sexual harassment in the late 80s and 90s and then there's a backlash and then we move forward and we start to question again and that's me too now in this time period and potentially there'll be a backlash but there's still movement forward there's still movement forward in questioning these gender distinctions and gender roles and what we expect of people based on their genitalia yeah. Right, and I think <laughs> for me, especially, like I'm, I'm one of those growing up, or like being a young woman in the '70s, mm -hmm. and like I, I rally, I cheerlead all the young women now in their late teens, early twenties, who are saying this is crap. Yes, <laughs> you know. So, yes. so hopefully, as more and more generations look at that picture and say, "Oh man, yeah, I backed off in my generation, but I'm, I'm with you now." Like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I shouldn't have, but I did. Um, so I'm, uh, you know, I'm going to come forward again now. So, uh, so hopefully, yeah, each, each rebellion, for lack of a better word, right. um, will get bigger and stronger and right. more powerful. So absolutely. Um, one question I'm just going to ask for our audience sake, because it was something I struggled with at one point in time. Mm -hmm. Um, and you set me straight is when, or after a person has begun their transition, mm -hmm. When you refer to the past, mm -hmm. pre-transition, mm -hmm. what are the gender pronouns mm -hmm. that you use? Mm -hmm. So this is, is, you are not alone. This is something that so... I mean, I know now. Oh, I know. Yeah, I know. There's so <laughs> many people that struggle with this. So it is most respectful of the person to use the pronouns that they use. So my daughter is my daughter, even if I'm talking about her when she was a year old. She is my daughter. When she was one, she walked and talked and 
all those kinds of things. That's so uh, even though at the time we thought she was a boy, <laughs> she is a she. And anytime I refer to her at any point in her life, I use her pronouns that she uses now. There is no need for me to use the pronoun that we used in the past because that's the past. And no one needs to have that information. If she chooses to share with someone that she is trans, if she chooses to share with someone her birth name, that is her choice and not something that is my choice, right? So I always use her name as she chose it, as as we chose it as a family. When she socially transitioned, we got out the list of, of names that we had thought about before she was born and said, these are the names that we were kind of thinking about. Do any of these resonate with you? Because really, it's like, it's up to her. She's her own person. I have no ownership of her. I have no, no, it's, it's not my place to say, well, I gave birth to you, so you're going to be called this now. You know, <laughs> that's, that's not up to me. I did do some gentle guiding <laughs> in the sense of, okay, well, that's, that name sounds really cute now, but are you going to like that as a 35 year adult, 35 year old? You know, are you going to like that name? Are you going to like people calling you that? That sort of thing. So, but it definitely we had conversations around it and that sort of thing and her choosing her name. So anything in the past, I still continue to use the name that she has chosen. I use her current pronouns regardless of the period of time. So, and that is the most respectful thing that you can do. People are going to slip up, right? That's the other big thing. Like I, I know for my mom, it has been a struggle for whatever reason. Still three years later, every once in a while, she will use the wrong pronoun. And <laughs> it's easy for me as the person not being harmed by it to be like, it's okay. I know you're working on it. But for my daughter, when she hears her grandmother use the wrong pronoun, it is hugely hurtful. I don't, I don't even know how, how, <laughs> what words to use because for her, for my daughter, it's like, it's been years. If you care about me, you would have this by now. It's a new way of thinking. It's a shift in our mental pathways and it's completely doable to change how we think. Okay. So you make a mistake and you say the wrong pronoun to your grandchild or your child because <laughs> adult, <laughs> adults come out too, right? So let's say you make a mistake. What's the best way to handle it? You say, I'm sorry, and immediately correct yourself. And then that's it. There doesn't need to be any further conversation about it. There doesn't need to be a long drawn out. Oh my God, I can't believe I made that mistake. And I'm just, I'm, you know, it's just so hard for me and I'm working on it. And I just want you to know that I really love you. And I, you know, I don't mean to hurt you and no. And it's all about me. No, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> because then it becomes all about you and how hard this is for you. And there is no trans person in this world, child or adult, that needs to hear how hard their lives make it for you. So give me two random names, a stereotypically boy name and a stereotypically girl name. Fred and Susan. Okay. Oh my goodness, Fred. Oh, I'm sorry. Susan. Just like that. Right? If you catch yourself, you just correct it and move on. And not this whole like, 
story <laughs> along with it. Correct yourself and move on so that they know they know that you caught it, you corrected it, and that's enough. Just as you did that, it occurred to me too that <laughs> You know, if we make a big deal of it, it is absolutely all about us because of my three children. I called them by the different names all the time. <laughs> so it's, you end up calling the dog the cat's name and the, the kid oh, I the my dog's kids name. And exactly. The, you know, I know. That. I know. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. So, okay. Is there anything I haven't asked you that should be mentioned? Let's go there first. Oh, my goodness. I'm sure there's something. <laughs> let me think. I don't know. Let me chew on that for a minute. Okay. I really wanted to bring this conversation to the podcast, so thank you. And let's end on a positive note mm -hmm. because I've known your family for a number. Oh my God, like almost 10 years now or 10 years. At it's least. Crazy. Oh yeah, it's just crazy. We've had this Skype relationship for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the differences in your child mm. since she was accepted and supported in her gender identity. Oh my goodness. Okay. I'm already like tearing up. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so one of the ways that we realized how important this was to her was that when she was in that really gendered environment of school and she started withdrawing and really going from being this vibrant, just talkative, alive child to really being hesitant and quiet and anxious and sad a lot, a lot of the time. And then we had this conversation around her being a girl. And we, like I said earlier, you know, figured out ways to support her. And it had gotten to the point where she had started to self-harm because her body was not what it was supposed to be in her mind, you know, that her body was betraying her. And after we had the conversation about her being a girl and gave her the support that she needed, she came alive again. And not that everything's smooth sailing, because there's a lot of anxiety around being a trans person in the world and how people react to that. So she str absolutely still struggles with anxiety. But seeing the difference in her and the first time that she put on clothes that she truly felt comfortable in and the first time that she got a haircut <laughs> that she felt good about. All these things that we take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis are or can be such challenges for a trans kid. Just even the choice of what clothes am I going to put on? Or when adults, when as parents, we force our choices onto them. Like, no, you may not cut your hair. No, you have to have long hair. You know, or those kinds of things where, where we're imposing our gendered ideas onto our children. But she is so much happier <laughs> and so much more confident and that vibrancy is there that had been squashed 
that had been really dampened by being in an environment that didn't support her. The word, the word that comes to mind for me was being ex- extinguished. Mm-hmm. That vibrancy. Absolutely. Me. Absolutely. I mean, if we, if we had not had that conversation and had not sort of intervened with support when we did, I have no doubt that the self-harm would have escalated. I have no doubt that I, I mean, she was 10 and talking about suicide. She was 10 and didn't want to be alive anymore. That's some heavy, heavy (laughs) bullcrap. That's some heavy shit right there. Yeah. And scary. And scary. Absolutely. Oh my God. I mean, I was beside myself and, and not knowing how to best support her. And that's, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I'm so happy to have this conversation with you because it's like, if somebody else gets the information on how they can respond so that that child is supported. And I, I, one thing I want to interject here Mm -hmm. is she would express that to you Mm -hmm. Because of the closeness of your relationship. Yes. If your relationship hadn't have been that close, yes. she might not have put those words out into Absolutely. the air. And the, you know, I, I don't even want to talk about the, the possible yeah. repercussions. Yeah. The, the possible end. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's what's so scary is that, you know, so many people say, oh, well, you know, transgender people are depressed and, you know, suicidal and all of that kind of stuff. It's not because they're trans. <laughs> It's because of the way the world responds to trans people. And that is one of the reasons why I have conversations like this. That's one of the reasons why I have conversations with people in my life on a day-to-day basis is because I don't want the world to be that way. I want the world to change and progress so that one day my daughter can just be who she is and not fear for her physical safety, not be concerned about bullying at school, not be concerned about, you know, how someone's going to react at a job interview if somehow it comes out or whatever. It's like, I want the world to be a better place for all kids, including my daughter. And as we've discussed before, in terms of any one person who's trans, mm-hmm. for the most part, for 99.9% of the population, it's nobody's damn business. Oh, absolutely not. Yeah. You know, so, so to make it your business just for the sake of bullying or mm-hmm. holier than thou crap, mm-hmm. um, it's just, it's, yeah, completely wrong. Um, okay. I'm determined to end on a positive note. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I will end end on a positive note because I have watched your daughter take uh what's the word? Uh when she was acting and dancing pre COVID, mm-hmm. um her costumes, mm-hmm. uh her hair colors, mm-hmm. her vibrancy, her jumping on the bed to tell me mm-hmm. something. Yeah, yeah. She's just she's come into her own and she is coming into her own. She's still young. Yes, absolutely. Um, and it's it's such a joy and uh it's, it's teenager next month i'm not sure i'm more worried about that than anything else <laughs> uh, at my age i'm just gonna sit here and laugh and meet you every saturday night on skype so you can go like <laughs> okay um i'm gonna be so bold as to say if anyone has any questions for michelle about transitioning youth um send them to me via the contact page at twoboomerwomen.com if you have any comments about today's episode, you can leave those at twoboomerwomen.com forward slash join dash the dash conversation. Thank you for tuning in today. I hope this conversation has helped you as much as my ongoing conversations with Michelle over the last few years has helped me. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Have a good rest of the day.